Hi, everyone. Hi, uh, my name is Rachit. I work with the Wikimedia Foundation. Thank you all for joining us. I'm also helping around with Wikimania. We have a next session and we will have our speakers on screen soon. So the next session is on data use and reuse. And we have uh, members of the Open Knowledge Foundation. We have Carol, we have Sashi, and we have Sarah who are going to be presenting. I hope you all can hear me. I said, we can see you, and whenever you're ready, you can go for it, and I'm hoping you can see the, the audience as well. Thank you. Thanks, thanks very much. Uh, welcome, everyone, to this Wikimania 2023 session. We're really happy to be here, although sadly only on screen. We wish we could be there with you, um, but we'll do with what we have. So welcome to this session, which is going to be about data use and reuse. Um, we're going to tell you a bit about how you can unlock the potential of frictionless data for Wikidata. Uh, before deep diving into this presentation, I just wanted to um, give you a little overview of how the session is going to be structured so that you know. Um, so uh, although in the program it said that uh, the session will last one hour and 15 minutes, this was actually uh, this will actually be slightly shorter. So we'll have a one hour session, um, which will start with a general presentation about Open Knowledge Foundation and frictionless data by myself. I will be followed by my colleague, Sassi, who will give you an in-depth analysis of how you can use frictionless data for Wikidata, and she will also give you a tech demonstration about it. Um, and then we will be closing the session with a questionnaire that we have on an etherpad uh, that will be shared uh, in the chat and among the participants as well. That's going to be a dedicated slide. Um, since we're not there, I ask you that maybe if you have questions throughout the session, maybe you can note them down and you can add them in the etherpad at the bottom of it um, so that maybe we can devote the last 10 minutes of this session to answering any question that you may have. Um, so before starting, maybe just a quick introduction from myself and also I want to give the opportunity to my colleagues, Sassi and Carol, who are here to introduce themselves as well. Um, I'm Sara Petti. Uh, I'm based in Bologna, Italy. And I've been at the foundation for a while now um, with different roles and wearing different hats. Uh, today, I'm here with my hat of Frictionless Data Community Manager, uh, but I'm also the lead of the international network uh, that I'm going to tell you a little bit about, about later. But uh, I leave the floor to Sassi and Carol to introduce themselves. Um, Sassi, do you want to start? Yes. Hi, everyone. I'm Sassi, and I'm from Nepal, and I work as a developer in Open Knowledge Foundation. And uh, I joined Open Knowledge Foundation uh, in 2022, and uh, I'm contributing. I'm I work as a maintainer and like uh, maintainer of open open source uh, software uh, under frictionless data in Open Knowledge Foundation. So nice to meet you all. Hi all. I don't think you can see me, but I'm Carol. I'm uh, Brazilian. I'm based in São Paulo, Brazil. Uh, I'm talking to you since from this very early morning, and I'm very happy to be joining this event. I'm partnerships lead at the Open Knowledge Foundation, and I'll be talking to you at the end about a partnership we are building um, upon this uh, application. Thanks, Carol. Thanks, Sassi. Um, so now it's time. Uh, let's get started. So first thing that I wanted to do um, is basically explaining to you a little bit what Open Knowledge Foundation is. So the foundation is a global organization that has been around for almost 20 years now. Um, we're turning 20 in 2024 next year. Um, and we are renowned experts when it comes to open data, open government, and open content more in general. Little spoiler alert, we are the ones behind the open definition. Uh, so um, if you're interested in that discussion, I would encourage you to stay in this room uh, because the session just after is going to be about that. Um, so what we do at the foundation is that we develop open source technology and we develop also communities around these open source technologies um, in the field of open data and open government. We also have, um, we have, we maintain and we support a network of uh, open advocates and open activists across the world in 40 countries. And together we promote open knowledge as a design principle. We are known globally as leaders when it comes to build a robust and sustainable open infrastructure for publishing, sharing and working with data. 
Um, so what we actually do in a nutshell is that at the foundation, we provide services, tools, and training that enable governments and organization and communities across the world to adopt open protocols as a design principle. Here you can see um, some of the tools that we developed. So frictionless data, of course, um, I'm going to tell you about this later, but we are also the ones behind the second project, which is a knowledge management system, which powers uh, open data portals for governments and organizations like the United Nations around the world. We are also, as I said before, behind the open definition, which is basically a kind of standard that defines what criteria content needs to respect to be defined open. And again, if you're interested in that discussion, I'll definitely encourage you to stay in this room and join us later for a conversation about the open definition. And last thing that I wanted to mention, since you're probably an audience here that is very interested in data, um, is the Open Data Handbook, which is um, a guide with case studies and very useful resources uh, that you can use uh, to make your um, data open. And I definitely encourage you to go and have a look if you don't know it. Uh, very useful tool available in many, many languages, Open Data Handbook. Uh, if you can just go and look it online, I'm sure it's going to be very, very useful. Um, on the, other, on the other side, what we also do is we do advocacy work. Uh, so we are the ones behind very renowned global projects like the Global Open Data Index, Open Spending, uh, Open Budget Data, the Justice Program. And we were also very well known in the second decade of the 2000s for the Open Knowledge Festivals, which were a big global gathering of data enthusiasts from around the world. Um, what we also do, as I mentioned, so uh, since we develop open source tools, we uh, are also community builders. So we have, of course, the communities that gather around our open source tools, a community of users and contributors, but we also have uh, other communities as well that, in, that we nurture. For example, we have a community of data trainers that get together under the umbrella of the School of Data. We have a global grassroots community of data enthusiasts that gather um, gathers online once uh, a year for the Open Data Day, which is actually now an Open Data Week, uh, happening at the beginning of March. Um, we also support the Open Knowledge Network, uh, which basically uh, maintains a curated list of um, open experts uh, under the Global Directory, which is a list of people that offer themselves uh, as available to peer experts uh, from the open movement. We have the project repository, which um, is a repository of projects uh, from the Open Knowledge Network. Uh, very interesting. I would definitely encourage you to go and have a look. And since the beginning, we're also supporting CSV Conference, which is um, the data conference for uh, organized by community uh, of data makers around the world. Now, time to talk about frictionless data. So uh, we're all here for that. What exactly is frictionless data? Frictionless data is a toolkit um, which aim is to remove the friction in data. So when we say friction, it basically means everything that can happen um, that prevents you from directly reusing someone else's data. So for example, you don't know who created the data. You don't know what the license is on the data, so you don't know what use you can make of that data. And removing the friction, it means basically that you can move from data to insight faster. Frictionless data is an open source project and is made of, I would say, two parts. One part is the standards um, for data and metadata interoperability. And on the other side, it's also a collection of software tools that you can use on top of the standards to perform a certain number of functions on your data to make them uh, more useful and open. It is also a range of best practices for data management. We have a big global community that is nurturing this project. And um, also very important, um, frictionless data is completely platform agnostic, which means that it's totally interoperable. But now, okay, that's all very well, but how exactly can you use frictionless and how can it be useful uh, in your daily uh, work with data? So frictionless, basically it's very helpful because it can help you making your data open and fair. So I'm going to repeat this, but I'm sure that everybody knows it here. Fair means findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Um, if you want to know more about it and if you want a good guide for this, I would invite you to visit um, 
a project called uh, the Turing Way, which is very, very helpful in that. I can paste your link after the presentation uh, in the chat, or I can put it in the etherpad, actually. Um, just a little reminder here also that um, open data and fair data is not synonym. Data can be open without being fair, and it can be fair without being open. Uh, and frictionless basically helps uh, in both ways. So what I'm going to do with you today is running through a series of, like, I would say basic functions that frictionless can do for you. And then Sassy will give you a more in-depth analysis later on about um, how you can use this with Wikidata. Frictionless started with a very simple idea, which is not new. Um, it's the idea of basically uh, building, containerizing your data, basically. The thing is when you share your data, um, if you want someone else to reuse your data directly, they need to have a certain amount of information about the data that you're sharing. So again, who created the data? What is the license on the data? What do the column names exactly mean? Um, how was the raw data collected, for example? And all this, all the answers to these questions are typically contained in what we call the descriptor of the data, which is metadata, so data about the data, and a schema. Um, the idea behind frictionless data is that to make it very easy for people to directly reuse your data, you would share your data and the descriptor together, packaged together in what we called a data package. It means that if I take my data, I package them together in a data package, and then I send it to Sassy to reuse, she can directly use it without coming to me and asking questions. So, this is the core idea of frictionless, but there's a number of things that frictionless can help you with, actually. So, um, for example, if you use uh, the software of frictionless, you can take your data set and basically, thanks to frictionless, frictionless can help you to describe your data. Um, so what frictionless will do is basically it will look into your data set and then it will provide you with metadata. So as I said, data about the data and also a schema, which is basically a description of the structure of your data. So this means the schema would give you an idea of what has to be expected in a certain cell. So say, for example, there is a cell for dates. Um, the schema will tell you that in that particular column, all the, all the cells will contain a date. So frictionless basically will provide this for you, uh, extract it from your data set, and it will provide it to you in a human and both machine readable um, format. So once you have that, what you can do, which is very exciting, is that you can then check your data for errors. So that means that basically what frictionless will do is that it will check against your, uh, your schema, uh, all your data set, and it will tell you if there are mistakes or there are errors, if there are things that are not expected that are happening there. And it will do that in a visual format. So giving you a visual report like the one that you can see here in the slide, um, which is very helpful because it will tell you directly where the error is and it will tell you what kind of error it is. So for example, here you can see there is a blank label. So it, Frictionless will alert you saying, be careful because there you need to, you need to put a label, for example. Or in that particular column, for example, there is a format that is unexpected, so go and have a look. So why is it important to validate your data? Um, there's a number of reasons, of course, and it's quite obvious. Uh, but um, to make it even more obvious, I wanted to bring to you an example from computational biology. Uh, basically, what happens in this field is that a lot of people use micro Microsoft Excel for their data collection. Now. Microsoft Excel is a proprietary software that would basically sometimes autocorrect some things. And one of the things that it does, unfortunately, is that sometimes it can mistake some gene names for dates. So you would say, well, not, it's not a big deal. But actually, if you have a very big data set, you cannot go and check it every time and you would not immediately spot the error. So what happens is that sometimes you would publish the data or use the data to perform an analysis, but actually the analysis is not correct and the data is corrupted. Um, still now, 30% of the published article in genetics have mistakes because of this Excel autocorrection. And the thing is, if you would be able to to do a simple validation like the one that I showed you before with frictionless. So checking your data against your schema, you would quickly actually spot the mistake and correct it. So preventing you from having all those errors and from corrupting your data. So that's why validation is important. 
Once you go and correct your mistakes, it is also very important to keep track of all the cleaning steps that you have. Um, and here I give you an example. This screenshot comes from uh, a pilot that we did with Bicodimo, and I'm going to tell you more about this later on. Uh, but you can see that basically what Frictionless will do is that it will record um, all that happened from the raw data to the clean data. Um, so, for example, here you can see that there is a date that has been corrected. Um, here there has been a conversion to decimal degrees. All of this would have happened because the Frictionless validation has... Um, spotted a mistake, alerted the, the author, who would go and then quickly make a correction. But once they make the correction, the correction would be recorded so that when I go and look at the clean data set, I can also know what happened in between the row and the clean data set. So it's very good for transparency and reproducibility. So that's in a nutshell, what Frictionless can do for you. Um, it's an excellent tool for data integration. You can, it goes from packaging data to transform data, validate data, and all these kind of things. It is also very useful for publishing and storing data because Frictionless has plugins for accessing and storing data, for example, in an SQL database. The nice thing about Frictionless is also that it has a sort of like holistic approach to open and fair data. So it provides tool for the full um, data pipeline from the standards to the Frictionless framework, which is basically a powerful Python framework also available in other programming languages that will help you to perform the basic function. Uh, that I showed you just before, like describe, extract, and all of that. We also have a frictionless application for the people that are non-coders. Um, so it's a um, UI um, on, available online that will perform the same functions that you saw for the Python framework just before in, um, in a user interface, so uh, with a clear UI. We also have a frictionless repository, which is a GitHub Actions that validates tabular data on every commit that you do on your repository. And we also have LiveMark, which is a um, um, static website generator that will extend Markdown, all your Markdown files with charts tables and all of that. So, um, before leaving you to the very skilled hands of Satsi, who will tell you about um, how you can use frictionless for Wikidata, I just wanted to give you some real life examples of people from our community that used frictionless in the daily work with data so that maybe you can understand a bit better how this can be useful for your particular use cases. And I will start with Libraries Hacked, which is a project from the UK, from England, working with library data. Um, so the problem here was that there was a big lack in England of public data about libraries. There was no central guidance on what data needed to be shared and especially how it needed to be shared. There were very few standards for libraries. So the idea here when an initial database started to be created, um, it was very important to define what data would be more useful and how that data needed to be structured. The thing is, you can easily, easily decide what data you want, but you can very easily as well fail to describe it properly. What, it, what does it mean? It means that, um, for example, if you could have a column, for example, in this database for closing date of the library or like opening times of the libraries, in principle, you would expect that everyone can, it's very easy for everyone to fill that column, that what will happen in practice is that you will end up actually with all kinds of different formats. So what you need here is a standard. And in this particular case, um, Libraries Hacked is using Table Schema, which is another um, friction standard, um, which would allow not only to have, uh, it, it will allow them not only to have a standard, as I said, but using the friction standard, it meant also that they could take advantage of the frictionless validation that I showed you before, um, so that uh, librarians inputting this database could have instructions whenever they had mistakes in the database and they could quickly correct them. Um, another interesting case is uh, Bicodemo. It's a pilot that we did with the Biological and Chemical Oceanography Data Management Office. Um, so what Bicodemo does is that it is a publicly accessible uh, data repository for oceanography data. They provide data management services, so uh, from planning to publication and archiving, uh, and they have a web-based catalog for all this data. So uh, at the time, 
what Bicodemo needed is that they needed to improve uh, the transportation of data to and from Bicodemo. They also needed more um, in, improved support uh, for data reproducibility. And also they wanted to have more efficiency and consistency when it comes to, to data, uh, because they didn't want to rely solely on the particular skills of one data manager. So what happened is that we joined forces with the Bicodemo team and we implemented what we call data package pipelines. So we developed a web application integrated into the Bicodemo submission um, on the website and web app integrated in the management system um, basically allowed them to have uh, the frictionless data main functionalities, which means that when people were, for example, submitting a data set into Bicodemo, when uploading it, um, the website would automatically do uh, data validation behind it. And as I told, as I, as I showed you before, um, it would also like record all the cleaning steps so that basically the data set once uploaded into Bicodemo will contain all of this very precious information. Another interesting use case comes from Deploy Solutions, uh, also part of our communities. Uh, Deploy Solutions are Canadian developers and basically they decided to build a climate change software prototype um, to help in emergency response for climate related uh, disasters. So these prototypes uh, is basically like filled with information coming from government officials, but also from people on the ground where the disaster is taking place. So what happens is that this prototype needs to manage a wide variety of uh, disaster related data sets from different kinds of providers with very varying degrees of reliability and quality to make sure that the information is accurate and actually usable. It was essential that the data uploaded was valid. And so to prevent, you know, mistakes and errors that can happen to everyone, um, integrating a validation check from frictionless data helped them actually making sure that there were no incomplete records or invalid information in the prototype. The last use case that I want to bring to you today, um, it's um, an extension of the data package. So the standard, the core standard of frictionless data for camera dropping data. And the main reason why I want to talk about this today is to show you um, the fact that frictionless is incredibly extensible and easy to use, and you can make it yours actually. Um, so here, for example, what happened is that the Belgian Institute for Nature and Forest Research um, is doing a lot of, um, of research with using camera dropping data. Camera dropping data is very useful to um, study observation of wild um, fauna. And uh, what they did is basically that they extended the frictionless data package to include a series of other stuff that is not normally included in a data package just because they needed them and they wanted to have a standard format to share um, and to exchange um, this data. So this particular data package, so the camera trapping one, uh, also contains, for example, information about the camera location, time, um, it normally contains a media file, a URL with a timestamp as well to know when the photo was taken. Um, observation about this file. Uh, sometimes, for example, you would the camera would detect movement and take a shot, but actually nothing is there. So you would want to maybe, you know, write down that. And also like metadata about the project in general. So all of this just to show you that um, frictionless is very extensible and basically you can use it and make use uh, to fit your particular use case. So that was um, a general presentation about frictionless and this extensibility, I think it would be very useful uh, when you want to use frictionless data actually in combination with Wikidata. We really believe that there is a um, powerful combination that can happen there, but uh, I leave the floor to my colleague Sassi uh, to talk about that. Um, Sassi, the floor is yours. Thank you, Sarah. Today I'll be uh, demonstrating about how we can use frictionless uh, data set, frictionless tools to um, in in the Wikidata workflow. And uh, by Wikidata workflow, I mean that uh, the steps, the pre-processing uh, data steps that we do before we upload the data to the Wikidata. 
Uh, so I'll so it with the example. So um I'll I'll be sharing my screen now. Uh, is it visible? So, yes. So um so this demo is mostly about uh, it's it's a simple demo, uh because the uh, frictionless tool has a lot uh, frictionless has a lot of uh features but i'll be using few features to demonstrate how we can validate and clean the data before uh, we uh, we upload it to the wikidata so um so here is the data that i will be using this is the data that i'll be using and this is the dummy data that i prepared for this demo and uh, this data has um, uses two id um, of um, of the like Wikidata pages, and these are the sandbox pages that I'll be using to update the features, uh, features of these two, uh, two pages, sandbox pages, and I'll update the property at uh, three different properties of these uh, pages. So this is the data that I have, and I have also prepared two files, which is resource file and pipeline files. Uh, Sarah has already described about the metadata, so. This uh, this resource file is the metadata for this uh, tabular data. Here you can see both uh, uh, metadata of the of this data, and this uh, data are both uh, useful for humans plus machines. Uh, like uh, this, uh, because of this metadata, it is machine readable. Plus humans, uh, plus uh, humans also can like uh, see the uh, know about this data by uh, looking into the description of the data, title of the data and also the fields here and uh, and other softwares can easily read this data using this metadata from uh, this file so here uh, like sarah said uh, this metadata describes uh, the uh, provides the description of the data plus it also defines the fields like what fields does this table have it has three fields which is qid property and value uh, here it's qid property and value and all of these three fields are of type string, but this, this type could be different, like integer, date, or anything. But for simplicity, I have used made it a string. And here I have added additional constraint, which is uh, which is um, that this third field should not be null, and the value should not be null. Um, this is what this uh, descriptor describes. And then I also have the uh, another file ready, which is pipeline. This uh, transforms, cleans and transforms the data. And I have already defined the steps, or what steps to apply to the data. Uh, and I'll describe about it later while uh, uh, during the demo, like while I'm running the demo. So uh, let's uh, see in this data that you can see here in this data, that this data is not valid uh, because the uh, this field is empty. But we have mentioned that this field should not be empty, uh, empty. It has to be there. And then there is another thing that is uh, not valid in this data is the format of the date. Because uh, to be uh, compatible to the Wikidata form, uh, format, we have to add plus or minus a string to specify whether it's uh, uh, ahead of UTC time or behind the UTC time. So that is not there. So the data is not valid. Now I'll show you how we can use frictionless tools to identify this and then transform the data so that it, um, uh, it uh, is compatible to the format of uh, Wikidata and then upload that data to the Wikidata. Um, for that, what you have to do is you have to install frictionless library. And uh, this um, the library that I'm using is Python, frictionless Python library. And uh, there are other, uh, there are, same library are uh, extended in many different programming languages as well. So if you want to use in Java or other different languages, you can use that in those programming languages as well. So, but today I'll uh, also uh, using frictionless file library. Here I'm installing frictionless, and uh, I'm also installing Excel plugin because uh, I'll be using that to convert the data to the Excel file. So once I install this. Uh, uh, because I have already run the, uh, ran this code, so I don't need to install this one. So uh, I'll skip that. And the next one is I'll import two classes, which is resource and pipeline, and uh, load the data. 
using the resource that JSON file. The resource class will load the data also and all the metadata of this data. And when I print the data using to view function, I'll see uh, the data that is here. It's printed here. And the last one has no value. It is converted to none and others is same. Now the next is, let's see, uh, let's uh, use frictionless uh, validate function to see whether it, uh, to validate the data. So I'm using validate function. And when I run this, sorry, I have to load this one because I have already ran that code. So here the data was loaded. And um, when I validated the data, uh, when I ran the validate code on that data, then it found that this data has errors. And the error, and that's why the this report that valid field is set to false. And it also tells you what error the data has. It says that um, cell in row at position eight, here at position eight, um, at position eight and field value at position three here, does not conform to the constraint which is required is true, which you may remember that we have mentioned it here. So it, it says that you have non, null value here. So this data is invalid. So now what we do is we, uh, for simplicity, I'll just remove this data using the frictionless transformation tool. But here another question arises, why didn't it identify the um, invalid format of the data here? It only uh, complained about this, but it didn't complain about this. It's because I haven't uh, mentioned that here as a constant in the metadata. So it doesn't identify that problem in uh, while validating the data. But we can do that as well. Using a custom function, we can pass checks here. And then uh, when we run uh, validate on, on the data using those checks, then it can identify that as well. Uh, that as well. So for now, uh, it doesn't identify, it just identify this one, but we have this pipeline steps. Now the next step I will do is I'll clean the data. And by cleaning, what I, uh, I mean right now is uh, I'll remove this data and also add plus sign in front of the state, which I have already defined in pipeline.json file. Here you can see in the pipeline.json file, the second step uh, says that the value remove remove all the it applies row filter and remove all the rows that doesn't have value on the value field and then add plus sign to all the uh, value in the value field which has a uh, property p571 so what it does is it, it will remove this row and add plus sign here uh, we uh, plus sign here when i transform the data so let's run this. Here you can see the data was, there were there were seven rows here. Now there is only six rows. The last row is removed and it adds plus sign in front of the date format. So now this data is ready to be uploaded to the wiki data. Now, but uh, before that, let's see uh, whether uh, the um, validation process still finds error in the data or not. So now it says the data is valid and there are no errors. The next step is uh, next step is uh, transforming this data to the Excel uh, format. Here we 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 uh, do not yet have in, uh, integrated frictionless data tools with uh, Wikidata API. So we we can't directly publish the data to the Wikidata that we are working on. So now what I will do is I will um, I will uh, I will save the data in the Excel format, copy it, and then upload it to the wiki. So let me delete this file first because it's already created. So when I run this using this write function, it will write the data to the Excel format here. I'll download this one and open it. So now this is ready to be uploaded to the Wikidata. Now it's the same process. I will use quick statements uh, 
to upload. This is the current state of this file. So I will refresh it to see the new changes, if it is applied or not. So here we see the new changes are applied. The last three steps are same, um, uh, which we are planning to like make it more easier. But uh, here, uh, so, so this is the last step to where we upload the data to the Wikidata. And this is not the only way we can use frictionless data. We can use it in many different ways and it has a lot of features which I couldn't uh, demonstrate here in this demo. Uh, but I just wanted to show how we can include this uh, tool in the Wikidata workflow. And uh, I and uh, I'd like to mention that we are uh, still um, for the non-tech users. These steps would be complicated, so we are working on the uh, graphical user interface um, interface to use the same feature. Uh, we are developing an application called Frictionless Application, which which uh, does the same thing using GUI. And we can uh, like see all the errors, load the files, and uh, run all the transformation, uh, apply validation, and see the errors. So we can do it through the graphical user interface. So this is the frictionless application uh, that we are currently working on. It is not fully complete. That's why I'm not. I'll not demo this one. But uh, uh, we are uh, very. Uh, it's about to be completed. So we'll release it soon. And uh, and with this, I would like to in, end my demo and hand it over to Sarah. Thank you very much. Thanks, Asti. That was excellent. Um, actually, maybe before uh, we jump into questions, I just want to give an opportunity to um, Carol, maybe to say a few words about um, this powerful combination of frictionless and Wikidata. Yeah, thank you, Sara. So uh, right now, what we are working on uh, trying to do with in partnership with uh, the, the team from Wikimedia Argentina is that we are trying to develop an application for GLAM professionals to be able to do this that Sasi just showed in an automated way. So this is an application that would uh, be very non-tech friendly user. Um, and help people to upload uh, clean data and validated data to the Wikidata in a more simple and easy way, even if you are not a developer and you are not usual, usually works uh, with spreadsheets and, uh, and values and data. So uh, for this, I would really like to ask that at the end, uh, well, the link is here, you join the Etherpad and uh, tell us what are your struggles when using Wikidata and uploading data or preparing data to upload. Uh, I think it's very important that we listen to the community and that we address actual problems or actual struggles that you are having so we can develop uh, a solution that is according to reality. Uh, we really do have a great team of developers in house here at the Open Knowledge Foundation, but uh, we constantly look out to listening to the community and to real world problems so we can um, not be apart, but be working together and developing solutions that actually work uh, in the best way and that you don't feel you are using an application or a technology or just like handling your data and uh, taking care of uh, the topics you work with and not uh, the tool itself. So please do enter uh, the Etherpad and leave your comments, questions, and suggestions. We also uh, encourage you to share use cases, uh, cases where you struggle or you had difficulties um, uploading data or preparing data to upload to Wikidata. Thank you, Sara. Thanks so much, Carol. Um, I think that at this point, we can maybe take some questions from the audience, if there is any. Um, if you go also on the Etherpad, there is actually a section just below where you can add also your question in writing, uh, in case there is some kind of infrastructure problem. But otherwise, I don't know exactly how this will function in the room, but just feel free to fire your questions now, if you have any. We have a mic. Okay, so we have two hands. 
Uh, hello. Given that uh, I, I'm Ferdinando, um, given that um, Opera Refine has a good Wikidata integration and works well for its purpose, why would you um, create a new framework that uses frictionless data and suggest it to GLAM institutions? Thank you. Thanks very much, Ferdinando. I'll start answering these questions, but Carol and Sassi, please feel free to join, jump on if you have like anything else that you would like uh, to say. Um, it's very interesting that you mentioned that. Actually, in the past, we also partnered with OpenRefine. Um, our idea here is mainly that um, OpenRefine is uh, a very, very valuable and quality tool, uh, but it's sometimes a bit complicated. So we're not here to compete with OpenRefine, but what we are looking at is like a completely different audience, which might be less uh, familiar with like programming tools and would feel more comfortable uh, in using a user interface. So the idea here is really to uh, integrate the app. So uh, not having to use all the software libraries of frictionless data, but just use the functionalities through um, user interface and an application. So we are mainly thinking about non-coder users here. And I don't know if Sassi or Carol wants to add anything to this. Yeah, definitely. We're just, um, this is not like a situation where we are competing with other two. We're just trying to offer an alternative that has an interface and, um, and is more friendly to non-tech users. Uh, I'm from the GLAM environment. I've been working with uh, librarians and archivists for a long time. And sometimes I feel that uh, the most easy in order to like just provide the data and hit a button and upload the data, tweak the data, the better. So we're trying to develop here something that uh, is easier to use than open Refine, but not competing, of course. Uh, this Anyone can use uh, the tool that they choose. To, to use. Thank you for your question. Thank you for the answer. Yeah, thank you. Um, Beat Esterman from Bern, uh, Switzerland, also in representing an affiliate of um, Open Knowledge Foundation, just this Swiss chapter. Um, to follow up on the previous question, uh, just uh, for precision, the easier to use tool compared to Open Refine. Does it already exist or are you just planning to develop it? That's my first question. Second question, what is the difference between frictionless data and linked data? Would you elaborate on that maybe? And the third one, uh, that's where I see like the biggest synergies with the Wikimedia community. That's in the area of tabular data it has been discussions about establishing tabular data on Wikimedia Commons to make it interoperable with querying Wikidata and tabular data. Is that anyhow in some area kind of on your radar or is that kind of, are you working on a completely different task? Thank you. Thanks very much. And lovely to see a face from the Open Knowledge Network here. Um, so I'll start answering some of your questions. Uh, for So starting with the first one about the application, as Sassi mentioned in our presentation, we, um, we have been developing this in the past year. It is now in a beta version, uh, but we are hoping to launch a sort of like 1.0 version anytime soon, <clears throat> probably like mid-September or something like this. So work is already happening there. And we're building also on the experience that we had um, in another tool that we used in the past from Friction is called Good Tables. That was a user interface as well that people <clears throat> with known coder um, expertise could use uh, basically to validate their data. The, the idea here is to broaden up what Good Tables was doing and doing it in a different way as well because we had some problems with Good Tables. Um, but so adding basically all the frictionless functionalities to the non-coder application. So this is for your first questions. I don't know, Sassi, Carol, if you want to add something, that's the moment to jump on this. Um, right now we are in the way of developing this tool. It's not ready yet. So if that answers your question, we are uh, at the moment where we are consulting with the community to find out what's the best way to uh, proceed with this. 
including uh, knowing more about how people use OpenRefine, if they would like a new tool or not. And so your f feedback is really valuable. And uh, hello for the Open Knowledge Network. Possibly so before anything on the app post. Yeah, so my Sorry, second question, my second question was about what is the difference between what you're doing on the side of frictionless data and linked data? Because in my understanding, in before actually ingesting your frictionless data into Wikidata, you actually have to turn it into linked data, going through all this um, mapping and matching uh, process. So you have to map against what is already in Wikidata. Is that somehow yeah. part of your pipeline process? Yeah, so thanks very much for this question. I'll let Sassi answer this because she's the most skilled here to answer this question. But I just wanted to uh, say it's something that comes up a lot in our community, actually. Um, linked open data being a very important part of data pipelines. Um, we don't cover that yet, but at the moment we are extending the frictionless standards. And so we would like this to be part, actually, of the frictionless data standard. But I'll let Sassi uh, expand a little bit on this. Yeah, I, I see. I uh, on on top of what Sarah had said, um, we haven't uh, yet decided to add, like, to work on the link data part while uh, integrating with the wiki data. For now, we are just uh, trying to use uh, wiki data integrate frictionless data with wiki data API so that we can uh, push the data with one but uh, push the data from frictionless application after it's processed uh, through through that application so that's what we are currently working on and we we do not fully support the linked data but i think the discussion like sarah said the dis discussion is going on and we're working on it so okay thank you i hope so, that answers yeah, it. yeah well, i i think that's um yeah, that answers the question, and I think that's still an area of challenge because it's not just about automatically pushing, it's about um, mapping and matching before pushing. And my third uh, question was kind of addressed both to you and maybe also to the audience in the room, like time series data, statistical data, population data, voting data, which are ex extensively used in the context of certain Wikipedias, um, but we're actually kind of lacking a proper solution within our movement. There, there have been proposals to support tabular data um, more extensively, but I don't think we have made much uh, progress in that area since COVID, I would say. Um, so. Oh, we can't hear you anymore. Yeah, we lost your mic. Yeah, the, the mic was dead for a while. Um, so okay. the, my, yeah. <laughs> I was ju there was just one question. What is the way forward in this area, like tabular data within the wiki community? Well, I think that's maybe more a question for the audience there. I can say that tabular data is at the core of frictionless, and that's how it started, really. Um, Sassi, Carol, do you want to add anything on this? Or maybe the audience, actually, if anyone would like to jump on this question. What I would like to add is, uh, like, we could bring this, uh, this to the... Uh, we could uh, discuss this internally in the with the technical team and then see how we could include that. So that's what I could say. From, from from our side. Hi, I'm Nicolò. I'm a user of Italian Wikipedia and Commons, another project. Um, I believe we should start using uh, more and more the, uh, tab the tabular data on Commons. It's already possible to host them on Commons, we, but nobody is, nobody is using them, mainly because it's complicated. Many people don't know that you can upload them and it's complicated to use them on Wikipedia, of course. Uh, we could start using using that namespace on Commons as we use it for, as we use images on Commons. Why do we have uh, the same data on Italian Wikipedia, English Wikipedia and so on? I mean, uh, we should work on that probably, I suppose. And of course, we need the good data to, uh, we need good, good data, of course. 
but the, um, technically it's already possible, I think. I uh, am Gergo, I am a media wiki developer. Uh, I wanted to add to that that, uh, as you might have seen, uh, Wikipedia has an extension called Graph, which is used to display, uh, among other things, tabular data, which has been taken down to, to, due to security issues. And the foundation is currently trying to figure out what to do about that. So I think this is a good time to get in touch with the people. Uh, the product manager of the editing team is uh, the one thinking about that, uh, Peter Paberg. So this might be a good time to talk to him about uh, what you think about the future of tabular data because uh, the future of the graph extension is somewhat uh, intermingled with that. Hi, um, my name is Jinoy. Uh, actually, I was updating the tablet data on comments for the India pan, uh, the COVID cases for the last two years uh, till the extension was uh, taken down. So, uh, like uh, every two weeks, I updated the information on the Wikimedia comments. I used the uh, added uh, this uh, graph extension on the Wikimedia ar uh, Wikipedia articles. It was sh showing on the English Wikipedia or Malayalam Wikipedia, it was showing for the last uh, two years, but because of the security issues, the graph has been taken down. So right now it's I stopped updating because there was no use at all. So yeah, if the graph extension is good, yeah, we can have so many information like election information we can add on the Wikimedia comments. Yeah, so this is a great example of usage that uh, uh, Peter Pelberg that uh, Gergen mentioned probably isn't aware of uh, unless he somehow encountered this work. So it would be great if you could do a write-up or if you already have a write-up, some blog post or something that kind of showcases this work and what it looked like when it did work, right? And why it's important and, and you know, what articles it's displayed in, etc. If you could write that up or prepare some uh, three-slide story about it, uh, and send that to Peter Pelberg and, you know, Gerga and I, or I can, can help you reach. Uh, is, is he here, Gerga? Is he here at Wikimania? Yeah, I don't know. Um, uh, that would help, right? Because when, when the foundation is trying to think, I mean, obviously this is not trivial to fix. If it were trivial to fix, maybe it would have been fixed already. But there, there's some issue there that makes it a question. Do we invest in this? Uh, will there be someone to maintain this after we invest in this? And one of the ways the foundation makes such decisions is how much of an impact is it really going to have? Is, is this extension used in a thousand pages or in a hundred thousand pages? That makes a difference, right? Because everything the foundation does is always at the expense of other things we could be doing, right? So, so someone has to make that decision. And one of the things that can help make that decision is stories like that. Yes, it's used much more than you might think. It's used in this way as well, not just for you know, the graphs that you can easily imagine, but also for this other use case. That's the kind of information that is sometimes difficult to see from the foundation headquarters, uh, or, or it is obscured by assumptions that we make, right? About what is, what is typical, what is likely, what are the uses we've personally encountered? Uh, that can really be augmented and influenced by community input. So again, I'm drawing two strong, bold underlines under what Gerga said. Oh, sorry, I didn't introduce myself. I'm a staff from the foundation. Okay, any other comments or thoughts from the room? And if not, then back to the speakers. I think we have one more slide left. Yes, thanks very much. Thanks, everyone. That's a very insightful conversation. And I mean, if ever you want us to participate in that, we would love, uh, we'd love to take part on that. We are very expert when it comes to tabular data. So if ever you need help, you know, which door you need to knock. Um, but yeah, just um, again, the link to the Etherpad, uh, if you want to complete the questionnaire, would gladly hear actually what are the problems that you encounter with um, with data. 
And just say you thank you uh, for joining this conversation with us today. Uh, here you have some links uh, to the Frictionless Data website. I really encourage you to go and have a look at the project website to see all the universe that Frictionless has to offer to you. We have a community chat on Slack, which is also accessible via a matrix bridge if you prefer to use an open protocol. And we have a Twitter account, and we also have a general newsletter uh, for Open Knowledge Foundation that I would really encourage you to subscribe to. Um, thank you very much. Uh, it was a real pleasure to be with you today, albeit only online. Uh, again, if you're interested in discussion in discussion around the open definition, uh, bear with us in this room. Uh, we will be back in 10, 15 minutes. Uh, but uh, yeah, thanks again for everything. It was a pleasure to be here with you today. Thank you. Thank you all. This thank was very a great much. discussion. Uh, thank you very much to the speakers and thank you for the audience for a great discussion. We're going to start this next session in the next 15 minutes, which is updating the open definition to meet the challenges of today. And we'll have some of them, uh, some of the folks from Open Knowledge Foundation back. And we have folks in the room as well who will be helping. It'll be a, a workshop. So you'll have some so you'll have some groups, etc. So please do come back. We'll start that shop at six in the next 14 minutes now. Thank you very much.